Hello everyone, lots of information to cover today, so let's get right to it. Muslims frequently criticize the God of the Old Testament, ordering the killing of men, women, and children. Now they can't generalize this criticism too much, or they will be criticizing their own Quran, which says, And when Moses said to his people, O my people, remember the favor of Allah upon you, when he appointed among you prophets and made you possessors and gave you that which he had not given anyone among the worlds, O my people, enter the holy land which Allah has assigned to you, and do not turn back from fighting in Allah's cause, and thus become losers. So the Quran affirms the conquest. Muslims can't criticize that specifically. This is where the criticism becomes more specific, and 1 Samuel 15 comes into the picture. Now go and strike Amalek, and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So first, as always, let's look at some background and context for the very pleasant topic of war in the ancient Near East. We have numerous examples of ancient Near Eastern texts that will communicate some very important points to us, but let's just look at a couple. From the Stella of Tutmos III, the many troops of Mitanni were overthrown in the completion of an hour, quite gone as if they had never come into being. Sounds like quite a victory. From the Merneptah Stella comes one about Israel. Israel is laid waste. His seed is not. Now we know this is not literally true because Israel continued to exist. About this text, Pritchard says, The statement that the seed, i.e. offspring of Israel, had been wiped out is a conventional boast of power at this period. Now many of you will already have noticed that we see very similar descriptions of conquest in Joshua. From chapter 10, Joshua went up from Eglon to Hebron and struck it with the edge of the sword and every person in it. He left nothing remaining and devoted it to destruction and every person in it. Similarly, in Joshua 11, uh, Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the country and all the hill country of Judah. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. But then just a couple of chapters later, we have the same people mentioned again. This is Caleb speaking. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day, for you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said, and just as apparently Joshua had done a couple of chapters earlier. And Dr. Richard Hess refers to a scholar by the last name of Younger, who has done a lot of work in this area. Younger has shown that similar expressions are used in ancient Near Eastern texts. He gives examples from the Merneptah Stella, which we read already. Israel is laid waste, his seed is not. And from the 9th century BC Moabite Stella, where King Mesha states, Israel has utterly perished forever. Now what I'm trying to communicate to you is something actually very simple. The way we write history is different from 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 1,500 years ago, and on and on it goes. The ancient writers were very interested in theologized history, or in this case, they would embellish war biographies, and they would do this to bring additional glory or praise to the king or to the deity. They're also more concerned with interpreting events rather than simply narrating them. John Walton says, Ancient narratives are not what we would call historiography. They do not attempt to provide the audience with information to reconstruct what a video camera observing the event would have recorded. Now this is where we need to be sensitive to people using different ways of writing. Note also that this does not mean that the accounts are lies in the sense that we mean when we call them propaganda. Both author and audience understand the genre, so there is no intention to deceive. But the accounts are primarily interested in interpreting the event and only secondarily interested in documenting the phenomena that accompanied it. So this is important because it lets us know that we need to look at the surrounding context. That will give us a fuller picture, and it'll give us more what we would understand in our modern day as history. With that in mind, let's get right into 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to assume a familiarity with the chapter as a whole. I'll refer to verses here and there. So if you haven't read the chapter recently, I would recommend you pause the video. Go ahead and do that because we're just going to assume familiarity with the text as we proceed on. We previously read some of this from 1 Samuel 15, 2 to 3. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel and opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. 
couple of verses later, Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. Notice later in 1 Samuel, in the same geographical area, we have the same people mentioned, and they've been there for a long time. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Amalekites. Sounds familiar. For these were inhabitants of the land from old, as far as sure, to the land of Egypt. So we have an apparent conflict with what we read in the first part of 1 Samuel 15, where Saul devoted them to destruction. And you'll see the word associated with this is cherem. Uh, he spared Agag the king, and then again, all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So we can easily see that there is an apparent tension in the text, unless we take into account this ancient Near Eastern war rhetoric. We're going to talk more about that and our interpretation of 1 Samuel 15 right now. I think the best way to go about this is just to ask some interpretive questions of the chapter. I've laid out a couple for you. The Amalekites were to be blotted out. What does this phrase mean exactly? Number two, Samuel's main concern is with the king of Amalek, whom he executes. Why is he so concerned with the king? Number three, not every person slash animal was killed. We saw this from our previous reading, and I have some more text down there if you want to look at those. Samuel must know this, aside from being a prophet. Just think, you're going to know back in that day what it would take to wipe out an entire people. You're going to know that Saul did not do that. Yet he doesn't mention the people who remained. However, number four, Samuel does mention hearing the animals. But confusingly, he doesn't give any orders concerning them. Now, any interpretation of this passage, I would suggest, must take these rather confusing elements into account. And I think that answering these questions really lets us see what's going on here in 1 Samuel 15. So let's start with number one. The Amalekites were to be blotted out. What does this phrase mean? Well, in Judges 19, we see the rape and the murder of a woman in Gibeah. We see Israel's reaction to this in the next chapter. Then all the people of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead. And the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the people of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. The people of Israel are clearly not happy about this. Now, Gibeah was in the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin refused to give these men up, and so the rest of Israel came up in arms against them. There's something very important in the ancient Near Eastern context here, and that is the concept of community identity. Before we get into an explanation, let's catch an analogy from John Walton. Like a human body, the larger community of Israel is made up of smaller units of tribes, clans, families, and cities, which we might compare to separate organs or limbs. All of them are part of the overarching community of Israel, but all of them have their own distinct micro-identity as well. Walton continues, It is not sufficient to simply disavow deviant individuals who possess community identity markers as somehow separate from the true community. Community identities do not possess qualities separately from the qualities of the people who constitute them and possess their markers. There is no true community apart from the membership of the community. If the cells in, say, your eye have cancer, then you have cancer. The entire corporate entity of you is sick as long as your eye remains both cancerous and attached to you. What any part of the community is determines what the entire community is. Now let's see how this applies to Gabia in a lengthy but illuminating quote from Walton. The assembly initially asks for the micro-identity of Gabia to be destroyed, but the larger community of Benjamin refuses to allow this, thus identifying themselves with the city of Gabia and against the covenant order. As a result, the entire Israelite micro-identity of the tribe of Benjamin becomes subject to Harem. That's the word we looked at earlier which is carried out in Judges 20, 48. Some individuals survive, yet the assembly still mourns the destruction of the micro-identity. Today, one tribe is cut off from Israel. The emphasis is identity, not genetics. And because no Israelite woman can marry them, their children will lose the Israelite ethnic identity marker and so vanish from the community of Israel. The solution to this problem is to find them Israelite women to marry so that their children will carry the ethnic identity marker of Israelite, that a tribe not be blotted out from Israel, thereby to preserve the micro-identity of Benjamin, 
within Israel. If this issue were simply preserving the genetic line, the surviving Benjaminites could have married anybody and it would have made no difference. And we see a similar concept in Deuteronomy 25. This is why Walton says, therefore being blotted out cannot possibly mean having one's genetic legacy die out. And this is the case of the Leveret marriage um, in Deuteronomy 25, five through six. And here he says, it is the family identity, not genetics that is preserved. Now returning to our first question then, the Amalekites were to be blotted out. What does this phrase mean? The blotting out of the Amalekites refers to, in Walton's terms, the removal of community identity markers. It has nothing to do with genetics or genocide. Now we can take the next two interpretive questions together and then nuance them individually. Samuel's main concern is with the king of Amalek, whom he executes. Not every person slash animal was killed. Samuel must know this, yet he does not mention the people who remained. Walton says, we should also note that Samuel in 1 Samuel 15 makes no attempt to kill the animals, but only kills the king. This is because the king is the embodiment and personification of the community identity, as also demonstrated by the promise in Deuteronomy 7.24, where the names of the kings will be wiped out, and by the proclamation of 1 Samuel 15.33 that Agag's mother will be childless. Samuel thus carries out the intent of the harem not by killing every last ethnic Amalekite and all their animals, which he does not do, but by terminating the final marker of the Amalekite community identity. Thus the harem in 1 Samuel 15, as with all harem against communities, has to do with destroying the identity or failing to do so. Walton emphasizes this is because once again the purpose of the harem is to remove a community identity from use not to kill individual people. Now we get into some really fascinating background information that gives us some insight into Saul's unfortunate spiritual condition. When Assyria or Babylon conquered a territory, they would destroy the national identity of the conquered nation by killing or deporting the king and planting a puppet regent on the throne, deporting the cultic and community leaders, destroying cities and temples, carrying away or destroying the images of the gods, and levying a heavy tribute to depress the economy. The purpose of this was to strip away anything the conquered people could rally around in order to stage a rebellion. The Canaanite armies are annihilated, or at least soundly defeated, during the conquest, but if the national identity that deployed the army is not destroyed, they will eventually raise another one. More importantly, however, the identity needs to be removed so that Israel cannot make use of it. This is the essence of the threat that they will become snares and traps for you. So this is some general background about some of the practices of the kings of the ancient Near East. What about Saul specifically? Once a treaty was ratified, the overlord typically would erect a monument in the territory to signal that the region belonged to him and was under his authority and control. Now, do we see something like this in 1 Samuel 15? Yes, we do. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. And I've added, not for God, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Now, this is theologically significant because Saul, instead of honoring God, sets up a monument to himself. And we're going to see further signs of spiritual detachment from God on the part of Saul as we get into our fourth interpretive question. Samuel hears the animals. He knows that Saul has let them live, but he doesn't really follow up with those questions. What's going on here? Well, I believe these questions are put there by Samuel in order to expose Saul's spiritual state. Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Samuel says, You have not obeyed the Lord. He wants an explanation. Saul basically repeats what he said before. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Saul has erected a monument for himself, and when questioned about the animals, Saul mentions sacrifice, there for sacrifice, not to my God, Samuel, but to your God. Saul is spiritually detached. 
And just as Saul has exalted and detached himself from God, so has God detached Saul from Israel. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. In summary then, we discussed the concept of ancient Near Eastern wartime rhetoric. We stressed that we need to take this into account when reading any ancient Near Eastern text, and this includes the Hebrew Bible. We saw how this explanation resolves the apparent conflict with the Amalekites, how they are apparently resurrected between 1 Samuel 15 and 1 Samuel 27, and we saw similar occurrences in Joshua as well. We looked at four interpretive questions for 1 Samuel 15. We talked about the removal of the Amalekite king, and hence the removal of national identity. We also got some insight into King Saul's life, and we saw how Samuel's probing questions about the animals brought up the issue of sacrifice, which then resulted in Saul exposing his spiritual condition. Sacrifice to your God, not to my God, or not to our God. We certainly covered a lot of information in this video. Hopefully this summary helps condense it and organize it for you. After conducting a thorough study of Muslim comments over the last 18 months, I'm now able to summarize for you in advance what Muslims will say in response to this video. Blah, blah. Blah, 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 Bibble is corrupted. Blah, blah, divert. Blah, blah, red herring. Blah, blah, non sequitur. Blah, blah, Bibble is corrupted. Blah, blah, some nonsense they saw on some Islamic website. Blah, blah, paid by the Jews. Blah, blah, racial slur. Blah, blah, Jews. Blah, blah, racial slur. Blah, blah, Jews. Blah, blah, Bibble is corrupted. Blah, blah, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Blah, blah, vacuum of Islamic thought. Watch for those comments, and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.